The next speaker uh, is uh, Ginny Barber. I don't really think she needs any introduction to this group. She's had an extraordinary decade of leadership around open access. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, so I was also asked to talk about um, what we've learnt from the PLOS model. Um, so I'm going to zoom through some of the things we've learnt, some of the things we haven't learnt. Um, I want to just say thank you to David about um, telling us about the open access at the Cochrane, which is fantastic to hear. Um, I'm not sure about inexorable rise. I'd like a more positive word about an inexorable rise of 08. Perhaps, you know, the, the wonderfulness. We're not turning back. We're, turning <laughs> not turn we're not turning back for sure. Um, and also, just to acknowledge at BMJ Open, we, we look with envy at some of the things that BMJ Open has done, and we'd like to do some more of them. And um, part of that is because, like, you know, submission systems, technical stuff, just kind of stops you sometimes from doing what you want to do. Okay, so I'm going to, this is a slide that we did last year. Um, when we hit our 50,000th article, we don't actually know which one was our 50,000th. We decided to bury that, but we all got terribly excited about it. <coughs> And we did a, a, a lovely montage of everybody that currently worked at PLOS at the time, including some of our academic editors and, and various staff. And it reminded us that, you know, we've come a long way. This is, in this is in less than 10 years. Um, and one of our journals, in fact, is the main contributor to this, PLOS One, which I'll talk about a bit later, which, um, which really has driven the, the enormous rise of what we've got. So what are the things I'm going to talk about? I've got five um, plus one extra, which I'd just like to um, say that I think we've learned from what we've done at PLOS. So the first is around access. Um, I kind of hope everybody knows that we're an open access publisher. <laughs> um, but not many people know what access means. And it all comes from this. This is a slide that I've been updating quite cheerfully for about six years now. Because the internet is a revolutionary technology. We could not have been having this conversation, you know, even 15 years ago. The internet has changed everything that we do in publishing. And I think one of the most shameful things about publishing nowadays is it hasn't adapted to it to a large extent. So my talk is really a, is all about the possibilities that the internet has allowed us to do. And James Boyle is um, somebody who's worked in Creative Commons. He's one of the real thinkers around open access. Um, and he wrote this uh, uh, seven or eight years ago now. Um, and it's been very prescient, I think. So access, what is access? Um, we, we're having a bit of a sort of um, birthday party this year at PLOS. We're 10 years old. We had a bit of a debate about when we were actually 10 years old, which is a typical PLOS debate, which is because we, we, we've been terribly bad at, at sort of documenting our history, but we decided we knew when we'd published our first journal. That, we definitely knew that bit, which was in 2003 in PLOS Biology. And around that time, we were a terribly sort of edgy publisher. We used to um, commission people to do cartoons for us, and we were sort of known as being rather strident. Um, and this was one of the cartoons that was um, commissioned back in 2003. Because this was the, the fundamental problem we were trying to address, which is that, you know, why can everyone read rubbish for free, but you can't read the stuff that's actually useful? Um, you have to pay for it. And this was in the Washington Post back in 2003. Because you know what the issue is. I'm not going to belabor this point. I used to have to belabor, take this people through, you know, what happens when you go to PubMed and you click on a link. But you all know, don't you, that if you want to search for something on PubMed, still most of it is not free. So I did this a couple of days ago. This was about SARS, which, as we all know, is a sort of a potentially re-emerging. I wanted to see what was published in it. I just did a very, you know, um, librarians in the audience, please look away now because it's <laughs> I just did it on one keyword. But, you know, I wanted to see what was published. Um, if you can see... Oh, sorry. Go back. All right. So, um, 5,000 articles. Only 1,300 of them are free full text. You have to get to number four before you get to the first free article. You have to scroll a long way down before it's clear that the first one is open access. I don't even know whether I want to read any of these yet, but I might do. And the problem is I can't because they're not freely available. Which comes on to the next interesting thing that PLOS did, which we, we, we realised a long time ago, it's not about just freedom uh, to read, it's about reuse. So, um, okay, I'm going to be really horrible here. Who, who would like to define open access as opposed to free access? Trish, you don't get to do yeah, this. <laughs> All right. If there's one thing you take away from this, this is, this is the slide, okay? Open is greater than free, um, which I thought, I think it's a great rallying cry, isn't it? Um, this is what free access is, okay? Many journals give free access. It means that you can read it, but there's usually an embargo. I'm not going to read the rest of it, but the key thing here is the free rights may be withdrawn at any time. Something you can read now doesn't mean you can read it in 12 months' time. 
This is what open access is. These are the Bethesda <laughs> principles, which were documented back in April 2003, so actually almost 10 years ago, um, and which have been modified and tweaked and amazingly in a, in organized, in a uh, sort of um, a movement which doesn't always agree with itself. We have kind of stuck to these, and they are really critical. It is, of course, free access, but it's also unrestricted distribution and reuse according to the <coughs> license, and I'll show you the license in a minute. The author retains right to attribution. You don't have to sign your copyright over to Elsevier. And the papers are immediately deposited in a public online archive so that if PLOS does ever go you know, belly up, your papers will be permanently archived. That's incredibly important. I would just say there are issues around the term open access. And we have jokingly, <coughs> from time to time, said, um, should we copyright the term open access? Because it's used by people who actually don't mean open access and who use it for their own means. And there is a real concern within not just the publishing community, but in the wider scholarly community about the rise of journals that call themselves open access but are not. It's something that you know, we have to address, I think, as a publishing um, uh, business. Uh, but right now, I'm talking about open access as, as done by the good guys, which is um, you know, us and BMJ, for example. So open access tells you all of this stuff, tells you what you can do with it, tells you how it's disseminated, doesn't tell you about any of this. It doesn't tell you where it comes from, doesn't tell you who the editor is, doesn't tell you about the peer review process. It just tells you, um, it doesn't tell you anything, anything more than, than the, simply the method of dissemination. And uh, for quite a long time, people talked about open access as being something that was incompatible with, low qual com with quality science and publishing. We know that's not true anymore. So here, here are the things that might be worth you knowing. Um, if, who's come across Creative Commons licenses before? Okay, actually, that's, that's the, this is an educated audience, I can tell, because quite a lot of people haven't. So this is the one that we use. It's Creative Commons Attribution. Um, this one is Creative Commons Attribution, Share and Share Alike. And this is Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial, which is the one that the BMJ uses for its research articles, I believe. There is another one, which is Creative Commons Attribution, which means you have to attribute it to the author. Non-commercial means you can't sell it without asking the original people. Non-derivative means that you can't take a Cochrane review and, um, and you know, chop it up into little pieces. This is the one that we use. We use the most liberal one. Um, and this is what we say on every paper. So you can say, you can tell exactly what you, need to, what you can do with this. Um, so this is the author. This is a paper we published a couple of weeks ago. It's an open access article. Creative Commons Attribution License, this is what you can do for it, and this is, what you, this is, this is who you have to ask, um, it, this is who you have to credit, you don't have to ask. What does this mean? It means all of this, you can <coughs> do all this you know, lovely stuff, you can put it in course packs, you don't have to ask us, please don't ask us, in fact, please, please don't ask us. I, the number of emails I get in my inbox, or I used to get in my inbox saying, can I do this? It's like, yes, please do it. And now they've stopped, which is great, and they're still reusing it. Okay, all right, on to impact. So that, that, was, uh, that was the thing about, that was, I think, reuse is one of the key things that, to take away from the open access um, movement, as it were. So impact. So we, we had a long think back in 2009 um, about this other thing that is, we felt fundamentally skewing the behavior of academics, the behavior of funding bodies, and which is really detrimental to the, to the future of science, in our opinion. That is the journal-level metrics, which I haven't even put on here because I can't stand the word, but I'll say it out loud, the impact factor, which is the absolute tyranny, I think, that many people um, suffer under. And we felt incredibly strongly that as an open access publisher, we wanted to show that there are better ways of assessing your science. In fact, I've been reading the tweets from the... Um, from the other sessions in whilst I've been sitting here, which is really terrible. But one of them, I think, that Mike Clark is actually saying is read the paper. You know, you don't have to, you can't tell anything about how good a paper is from whether it's published in JAMA or, or the Lancet or the New England Journal or the BMJ. You have to read the paper. And that's essentially what article level metrics is. It's the equivalent of read the paper. And because we know that despite the fact that most um, uh, the journal level metrics are based on um, citations. There are all these other things. Oopsie! All these other things that people do nowadays with it. You know, all these they they read it, they cite it, and of course they do all this other stuff. So I'll show you a, a few things about what's happening with our papers. And I have to thank Martin Fenner, who is um, who works for us on article level metrics. He was the person that put these slides together and has done much of this an analysis. 
because this is the, these are the stats. So November last year, 63,000 papers. Do you remember I told you we'd already gone over 50,000? <laughs> Um, 124 million HTML pa page views, but actually only something like 374 cross-ref cita citations. It's a tiny proportion of the overall usage of our, of our data set. And if you come to look at what happens to the articles pub covered by, published by source, that's even more interesting. So just to note, what this is, this is um, all the 63,000 plus articles um, up to November 2012. The, um, the <laughs> The eagle-eyed of you in the audience will notice that we've changed. This was before we changed to a big O in our logo. One of our biggest things last year was we had a rebranding. We went from a big O, to, a little O to a big O, which was terribly exciting for all of us, but possibly not for anyone else. <laughs> but look, so much to our relief, you know, 100% of our articles get read. I have to say, before we launched this program, we did have a complete panic about two weeks before when somebody said, what happens if there are papers that nobody reads? You know, and we thought, well, everybody's you know, got a mother or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, or, the, or, or just lab colleagues. They'll, this will not happen. And fortunately, we, 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 we gritted our teeth and did it anyway. So they all get read. They all get read on PubMed Central, which is really fascinating. Um, this, is, so this is the whole corpus, OK? Um, they get citations in all of these places and they get looked at at these academic places. Not very many of them get comments, that's frustrating for us. And for the entire 10 years, 13% of our tools had some sort of Twitter activity. Okay, what happens... Okay, I pointed that out. All right, what happens... So this is six months of articles, a recent six months, May to November 2012. Again, 100% are being read on the sites, 90% at PubMed Central. Not many citations, where well, you wouldn't expect that, because they're quite new, but look at this. 49% of articles have had some sort of Twitter activity. That's absolutely astonishing. We now find that Twitter is driving, is the third biggest driver of activity to our sites. So if you're an author and you're not tweeting, you need to be on, that, on Twitter. It's really fascinating how it's changed. Okay. All right, so some other interesting things that happen. These are PLOS Medicine articles. There's a sort of broad um, uh, correlation between um, how old articles are, number of citations. The bubble colour is the article type. These are research articles. These are non-research articles. Um, I don't know. I, actually, I wouldn't like to do any stats on this, but, you know, it sort of broadly goes up, as it were. Uh, what, what was this one? This was a... Um, this was an interesting, because this was a paper that was uh, part of a um, series on big food. And which we published last year. I don't know if any of you have seen it. If you haven't, it's a fantastic set of papers, um, which, which elicited some very interesting responses from the big food industry, you'd like to know. Um, look here, this actually, you see the correlation of HTML views with tweets, and these are Facebook likes, so this is really interesting activity that's driving um, the activity on these papers. Broadly speaking, HTML views correlate with PDF downloads, and this is something we're very interested in because, you know, we, we kind of we don't have an idea of people who actually use our stuff because we don't have any sort of login. But we have a feeling that, generally speaking, HTML views and PDF downloads broadly correlate in some circumstances, especially for academic use. Other types, they don't. So here's a paper where it really didn't. This was a PLOS One paper, of course. Um, 226,000 downloads, 0.3% percent, percent of articles led to PDF downloads. Um, why was this? So this was being driven by Reddit, which is a, a sort of social media. And in, actually, if I'd known yesterday that, that we were going to sort of be having a sort of very honest set of conversations, I wouldn't have blanked out these, um, these slides, but I did in the sort of interest of, uh, of, of, of people's uh, sensitivities. But you can see this was read by people who were, who were clearly I I rather interested about what was happening to, to them themselves on, after having taken cannabis. And uh, it drove a quarter of a million views to this paper in no, no time at all, which was kind of interesting to us. In fact, I think it was one of the ones that crashed our website. This happens to us fairly regularly. But it's led to this, this, this idea that we have, which is that you can broadly look at a scholarly user and a, a not quite so scholarly user, shall we say, and we find that if you have more than about 10 to 12 percent of articles with PDF downloads, that indicates that it's of pretty in high interest to the scholarly user, less than that, and it's probably going to be looked at mostly by um, non-academics. But that's okay. Um, 
uh, I won't, uh, I'm probably running it slightly out of time, but one thing we are very aware of, these things can get gamed. We know that. We have ways of looking at it. It's not entirely perfect. We're very interested to work with anybody who, who wants to try and figure out um, how you um, and analyze these so you can take them out of the data set. We know it's a problem. Okay. And these are some of the questions we're thinking about with regard to article level metrics. Um, okay, I'm going to go quickly on to editorial criteria. Am I doing okay for time? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So editorial criteria, I'm going to talk about two journals plus medicine because that's the one that I'm involved with and I've got some lovely stuff at the front so please do come and take it if you're interested. Um, PLOS overall is a sustainable business and we built our editorial criteria in two ways. We did it in journals that are very specific and we did journals um, uh, that are more general and I'll talk about why I think it's worked for, both, for two of these. So I run PLOS Medicine. Um, why did we, um, what did we try to do with PLOS Medicine? We tried to um, show that like PLOS Biology, which was our first selective journal which was published in October 2013, <laughs> that we could launch journals that challenged the idea that open access publishing is about rubbish. Um, we have gone on to launch four subsequent community journals, um, and I'm responsible for pathogens and neglected tropical diseases. I oversee them, but I'm, I'm not the editor of them. Um, and then we went on to launch PLOS One, um, which has a very different model. And what do we learn from these? Well, the first thing about PLOS Medicine is this, is that you can make a journal that is open access, high quality, that's not just about, not just about open access. You can be ethical, you can take, you can take stances, you can, you can campaign in all sorts of different ways and it doesn't necessarily frighten the horses too much. People do publish with you and they actually want to be involved. And that's quite important at a time when I think publishing was really quite conservative when we, we did this. Um, we've specifically um, campaigned in various areas. Um, this is one slide which shows we campaigned on global health estimates. This was a series on neonatal and maternal care. This is one, we published a lot on the, on the influence of the tobacco industry and how they attempt to subvert publishing um, and some of their tactics and how they attempt to subvert um, policy as well. And we've got some interesting papers coming out shortly on that. Um, and ghostwriting, which is, goes to the core of what medical journals, um, are, their involvement with the pharmaceutical industry, an issue where people have said this is gone, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't do this anymore, we actually know that's not the case. Um, and we've published extensively on it and taken some leadership in that area. But this is, this is the journal, I think, that has kind of changed the game in publishing in many ways. And um, uh, one of the, has led to many innovations such as BMJ Open. And PLOS One is, uh, its key innovation, I think, is, is its editorial criteria. So again, we don't ask the question, um, how important is this work? We don't ask the question, what's the relevant audience? Um, our theory is that everything that deserves to be published will be published, and the journal's not artificially limited by size. Can I ask if there are any PLOS One editors in this room? Oh, okay. All right, we have 4,500 editors on PLOS One. So we have a very different model from BMJ Open, which is based on the peer review reports. We have an enormous federated editorial board. Um, and that in itself is really fascinating. We're doing, looking at ways of how you manage that, which you can, you can understand is something of a challenge. Has it been successful? Do people think this works? Well, let me just show you this. Um, and I have to thank Damien Patterson, who's the executive editor of PLOS One for this slide. Publications by PLOS One per quarter since its launch. And this ends in the quarter, last quarter of 2012. It's still going up. PLOS One gets 4,500 submissions a month. So do people like PLOS One? Yeah, I think they really do, actually. But there's lots of other, and actually lots of other publishers have realized this actually might be something that's quite a good thing um, that they can do. I would, of course, say that actually Biomed Central actually predated us, so um, I please I don't want to say that um, we came after them. They very much led the way, I think, in this, this sort of model of publishing. But it has changed fundamentally what publishing is about right now. And it's, as an author, I think it's tremendously interesting to be on, that, on the side of that. Okay, Harold Varmus, who was one of the founders of PLOS, of course, he's a bit like um, the um, Ian Chalmers of medical public. You know, he's all, everything we say, he's already said. But he said this back in 2005, that, we, that this is where we would be. And indeed, we, we kind of we are at the point where um, papers will be vetted for scientific quality, but not their likely importance. 
Um, these are some of the reasons why we think it's worth. I think the main one I would just highlight is that we think it's leveled the playing field, that it has made people able to publish um, who may not have had the um, access to journals before. We know there are issues. There are, this is a model that is evolving, and I would just encourage any of you who sort of view it with fear to, to get involved, because we very much want to build this. I think this, this is where publishing undoubtedly is going, and I think publishing will look very different in a few years' time, and, and it's important that everybody who wants to be is, is sort of involved in it. So speed, um, this is an, an issue um, for all journals, and it's around the technology around publishing as well as the peer review process. This is something else we're experimenting with, um, which we started as a result of the, the when the swine flu um, uh, epidemic happened a couple of years ago, that there was concern that it took an enormous time for, for very rapid papers that needed to be published to um, get out there. I, I was an editor at The Lancet when the last SARS epidemic happened, and um, it was a tremendous problem in that we simply could not publish the papers that needed to be published at the time. And in fact, a paper published by Paul Garner in PLOS Medicine subsequently showed that most of the papers on SARS were published up to 10 years after the actual epidemic happened. It was, you know, it was kind of too late by then, although it's kind of coming around again, so maybe we'll, it'll get there in the end. And so um, Plus Currents is, a, is something we're experimenting with. It's a direct authoring and publishing platform. It's actually based on a Notum, which is um, similar to WordPress. Um, and it's something we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to figure out how this can fit into the publishing landscape. This is what it looks like. Um, I've got a card up here for one of the other sections, which is Plus Currents Disasters, which I'm involved in. Um, and our, it, the thing we'd most like to think about here is that can we actually tr experiment here with non-traditional article formats? And I think that's a very interesting idea for where publishing might go. So what's the last thing? I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I think the key thing we've learned is around experimentation, that um, publish publishers are traditionally very conservative, there's a lot of money involved in it, people get very anxious about the idea that um, you can't change things. We think you can change things. How do you change things? Well, I think that these are the, the lessons I would take away. That um, although uh, when we were founded in 2003, our funder, uh, the three people who founded us, Pat Brown, Mike Eisen, and um, Harold Varmus, who are all terrible, tremendous revolutionaries, said, well, just go and fix it. You know, just go and make this change. And here we are 10 years later, and you know, we're, we've done some things. But we haven't done all of the things they wanted us to do. Uh, you do have to change things one thing at a time. I think one of the arguments or discussions we had at PLOS Medicine was around open peer review. And in fact, when we first started, we felt that was a battle, you know, one battle at a time. We chose not to fight that battle at that particular time. Collaboration is a good thing to do. Um, and if you do experiments, of course, you've got to adapt to them. Um, and we've tried to do that. I think the wider thing that we really have learned is that publishing is a service industry. And I think authors sometimes forget how much power they hold in that relationship, and it's very important to them um, and to us, I think, that they exert that properly. It's possible to keep your principles and do all this, um, that you can be a catalyst for change. We've been involved in many of the, I think, changes that have been going on in publishing over the past 10 years. Um, but in the end, it, you know, much as it pains me to say it, open access is a means to an end. You can't have evidence-based medicine without access to it, and that's where I think we fit in the spectrum. So thank you very much. <laughs>